Hi everyone and welcome. Jenny Marples here from pushingtherightbuttons.blogspot.com. Thank you for joining me today. I mentioned in my last video that I had a brand new tutorial coming up for you and today's the day. A little while ago I put out a call on social media asking people to let me know about the kinds of techniques that they wanted me to share with you and one of the uh, resounding calls was one for using paint on fabric so both stamping and painting onto fabric and kind of ways of using that so I've put to get put together today's tutorial um, and since we're right in the midst of preparations for the upcoming Halloween night uh, festivities um, I've put together a little creation a little trick-or-treat bag uh, with this little guy as the focal image so I thought I'd share with you how on earth to go about creating this and then show you how the bag actually came together. So let's get started. Pop this out the way. So I've got very basic um, cotton, calico, muslin, sort of a really basic untreated calico. Um, what I would say to you is if you're going to use paints onto fabric, make sure that they um, have been, haven't been treated with anything because it can affect how the paints react to the surface. Um, one of the best ways to do that maybe is to uh, pop it in your washing machine, um, give it a quick wash or even hand wash it depending on the size of the piece of fabric, give it a quick iron just to make sure it's flat and that removes any of the size or anything that might affect the surface. So I've already stamped one image out and I'll explain why shortly but this image is this one here, the one in the centre here and this comes from Tim Holtz Inventor 4 stamp set. So that's CMS347. I'm sure a lot of you will already have this collection. And I'm going to start, I'm going to just stamp out this particular pumpkin at the bottom rather than using the whole image. Um, I've done various different ways, tried out various different ways of actually stamping the basic outline before starting painting. Um, I have used archival ink and archival ink looks absolutely great if you use it um, but it does actually produce quite um, a paler look to it. The only way that you would be able to get it slightly darker would be to use your stamp platform and do repeated stampings which would work. This is another alternative and I'm going to use um, Dina Wakely Black Gesso. So this is Dina Wakely Media Black Gesso again available from all your favourite stockists and I'm going to apply it using this is a little piece of cut and dry foam um, this way it acts as uh, like a mini ink pad and it also controls whereabouts the paint is going to go which is quite important in this case now you'll see I'm loading it on I want to make sure I've got plenty in there and what I would normally do would be to do multiple stampings um, so this is great if you've got a little bit of a production line going for your uh, for your treat bags because I know you'll probably need more than one so I've got that loaded up now what I'm going to do next is to cover the Halloween image in the gesso so I'm just going directly on. Now this is why I've used the cut and dry foam because as you can see I can just cover the areas that I want so the pumpkin without going over the words around or any of the other images and you'll see I'm not being very careful in terms of where I've got the uh, gesso being applied when it's going on to the actual image itself. The reason that I can afford to do this is because this is a deeply etched stamp, a deeply etched rubber stamp and I would suggest that it's far better to do this kind of technique with something which is deeply etched, be that um, high grade acrylic or in this case um, one of my favourites which is uh, the, the, rep, the rubber. So I've gone in and made sure that I've covered that image completely and now all I'm going to do is flip that over, line it up 
and then just press down. And I want to make sure that I'm pressing firmly on to that piece of calico. Really making sure that I get contact in the centre. Now, I'm actually doing this onto my craft table, which isn't the best because it kind of bends a little in the middle. So that's why I'm paying extra attention. What you can actually do, if I just show you carefully, I've just flipped it off the edge of my table and you'll see it's actually stuck down slightly so I can kind of cheat and go in with my fingers just to make sure that I've got that gesso applied. Obviously do that if you feel confident. The other thing that you can do is again you could use your stamp platform for this um, because with the control that you've got with applying with the cut and dry foam it does mean that you can go back in and reapply but let me just lift off and look at that look at the clarity that you get now I'll pop my stamp out the way what I would do is make sure that I get that into cold water I say cold because that then um, prevents it from setting on your rubber stamps and it's very easy to then clean off no problem now, the reason why I've stamped a second image below is because I normally give this a good couple of hours to dry before I start painting it. If I were to paint it while it is still wet at this stage, even though it's actually touch dry, um, I, I stand the, uh, the danger of actually getting the image to blur and bleed when I add the next layer of paint. So always give, give it a, a good couple of hours depending on how warm your room is. Um, if I've done multiple stampings then what I'll tend to do is just put that sheet aside and I'll come back to it maybe the day later and start painting and that way I know that I'm not going to have any dramas with it at all. So now we need to start to get painting. So I'm going to, I'm only using two colours with this one, um, so not too heavy on the, uh, the expense if you don't have these colours. So the first colour, and let me just give this bottle a quick shake just to make sure. So this is Ripe Persimmon Distress Paint, okay, and I love it because it's got that really deep colour, that really deep orange almost like a, um, it's got a touch of red in it as well. I don't need huge amounts of this. So I'm just gonna scoop some out, putting it directly onto my craft mat and pop that to one side. And then I need about an equal amount of water. So I'm just gonna go in and spritz. I would say half paint to water if you're looking for a ratio. You kind of, as you start to do this, you, you kind of get the feel for when you've got the right colour. Now, why do I think this works? I'm not, I'm, I never profess to be something of an expert in any of these, but I think it's the fact that I stamp with neat paint. And yes, you can stamp with the paints as well. Um, so stamp with neat paint and gesso. And then I go on with diluted paint is the reason that this layer will actually act as a resist and the underlying image will come through when you start painting. So that's that's my kind of theory with it all. To get the colours onto here, you'll see all I'm doing is I'm using a fine paintbrush. Um, so pick out one of the, the fine, finest ones you've got because that gives you again more control and feel free to move your fabric around. Keep checking the screen just to make sure I haven't gone off camera with this as I kind of get lost in the process. And you'll see the image starts to show through underneath, but please don't panic if it looks like you're obliterating everything. You really are not. Okay. So the next bit, I'm kind of covered most of the shadowing there and, and made it uneven. The next thing I'm going to do is to just follow those lines down because I want to create the, really follow the shading from the image itself. Tim has gone to the trouble of 
selecting images which already have um, all of that shading and um, the highlights in there. So I'm kind of just following along with what he's done there. And I'm skipping the mouth because I want to leave that the base colour so that it really stands out. And just following these lines along, just carefully. Um, what I would say, obviously, you've got water in this paint. So just don't go in too heavy handed, okay? Because when you've got the paint onto the surface, this is dry um, muslin that I'm going on to. Um, so when you've got the paint onto the surface, obviously you see that surface becomes wet. And if you leave everything around it dry, it doesn't bleed. OK, but if you now start to add paint and you go over the lines, you will find that that will then start to bleed and it will pull out any of the paint that you've already got down. It will start to pull that out into other areas of your image. So just take a little bit of care. It's all it's just like painting onto paper. Obviously, paint when it goes down is permanent. Um, I know that the distress paint has a little more open time and, and is reactive with water while it's still wet. Um, but once it's dry, then that again obviously is permanent. So just going in and you'll see I added corresponding shading at the top there as well um, so that I can then pull in the second colour. So we've done that. You can see here, I'm going to sadly mop away that excess but you can see you really don't need very much and this is why I suggest maybe doing um, several images all in one go because then you you kind of are using up that paint uh, rather than wiping it away so again going in just give my paint a little bit of a shake I just want to pull a small amount out from this one and that's it just well Again, probably way too much. This one is one that I've used in the past when I did the faux rust technique. So this one is Spiced Marmalade. Again, a beautiful colour, but it's slightly lighter than the ripe persimmon. So again, we'll go in with about equal amounts of paint to water. Get that all nicely mixed. You'll see it blends really, really quickly on this glass surface. And then all I'm going to do is to go in and paint over the white areas. And what that will have the effect of doing is to slightly bleed into the underneath. Now, it looks like I'm going over the top of those darker lines, which obviously I am. But what I found is that um, what happens is the colour that is at the bottom is the one that's going to take precedence. So if, for example, I decided, oh, I fancy adding more highlights to this and I went over the top with an even lighter orange, that would actually disappear into the background. So think about the layers in advance. And if, for example, I wanted to go in and use... Uh, wild honey and add that to the centre what I would need to do is leave that area blank and then go in um, and, and paint it on because that's the colour that would take precedence well that's been my experience in a number of years of painting on fabric too many to mention so you can see it's not taking too long you can see it is bleeding in again at this stage, it always sort of it looks worrying because you think, well, maybe that image isn't showing up very well. Uh, maybe I haven't stamped hard enough. This, again, is, is one of those where it's, it's don't panic, carry on, trust in the technique, and you'll discover that as it dries, all that detail will start to throw, show through. As you can see, it looks very much like I'm covering up all of that dark uh, the right persimmon underneath but in fact it will remain there okay so just the final parts here and I will turn this round just because it's easier 
painting at that kind of angle purely because I'm right handed. Obviously it will be the other way around if you're left handed. And there we are. You can see that really didn't take a huge amount of time. And already the image is starting to show through. So let me just hold this up to the camera very steadily for you. So you can see now where that colour is kind of sinking into the fabric. And I give that chance to do its magic. I leave that aside to dry. Again, I would strongly suggest maybe leaving it for a good 24 hours and you will end up with this. How cute is that? Just love that. Okay, so you can see here where that orange, it was exactly the, done exactly the same way. That ripe persimmon has come through, those lines have come through, and the spice marmalade has shown in the middle. And you've still got all that black stamping around. So, very easy. I'm sure you'll agree. Three easy steps. Okay. I have a feeling people are going to say, oh, I've got a cute little treat bag. How on earth do you make it? OK, I could make this video an awful lot longer by showing you all of that. But what I will do is give you a, a very quick guide to the way that I created this. Um, so I cut two strips and I would uh, I'm going to make a, a suggestion here. I cut two little bags. I cut two strips of this is the Eclectic Elements fabric and they were yeah it was about 10 inches long by about four and a half inches wide my strips I would strongly suggest that you make yours larger because boy this got fiddly at the top it really did so make your treat bags larger and do yourselves a favor um, all I did was cut two um, oblong strips and then I turned over each the each end of the strip at by about half an inch or roughly a centimeter at the top and then again sewed down the sides on the first one so you'll see there it's a reflect mirror image so sewed down the sides again it was about half an inch four eighths of an inch so just over a centimeter so I did that for one and then the second one is a little bit more complicated, similar process, okay, exactly the same size. But on this one, I sewed down to the top of the fold over and then left a good half inch centimetre or so gap and then sewed down to the bottom. And I will do that for that side as well. You'll also notice that I've actually clipped in at the side here, so cut at about 45 degree angle to get rid of any bulky material that will end up in the corners. Now you're going to wonder where on earth have I put this little guy, because as you can see from the original here, this has actually been sewn on so that it won't shift or move. So what I did was before I sewed down the edge, I um, held the fabric up put the whole fabric out and I came up again about half an inch centimetre from the bottom of the the middle if that makes sense and sewed this on placed it in the middle and sewed it on okay so if you can see from the wrong side here um, so I would sew it on about half an inch up and into the centre um, at that stage sewed it on Again, I've re I would recommend, I went round three times, partly to make sure it was secure, partly because this is a fantastic way of disguising if you do any wobbly sewing or a stitch misses or anything else like that, and you really don't want to spend your life unpicking, especially if you're making a lot of these, sew round three times, and then it just looks like you designed it that way, okay? So what am I going to do to finish this off? What I will do is... Now I've got the panel on the inside and I'll repeat that process. I will sew up and then just sew the top together and clip. And then what will happen is that I will turn this one the right way round and I'll leave this one the wrong way round. Fit the two 
into each other so that they are right sides to, uh, they're wrong sides together and then I will sew you know where that gap was at the top I'll sew a channel so a long half an inch down centimeter or so down from the top I'll sew a channel all the way round um, so that's sewing it all the way round the edge and keeping obviously keeping the bag open and then I'll do it again about an inch down from um, from the top to create this channel there we go so you can see that there so then what I'll have is those little gaps at the side that I've already sewn in and those will be open and then I can put a piece of I can put pieces of thin ribbon and slot one through one side and round and back and another slot it round and through the back the other side okay so that I've then got a tie pull I also did do a little bit of stitching on the top here if you can see so I just neatened the edges and actually joined them together and then you've got a little bag which if I pull it apart you can see looks like this and is fabric covered on the inside as well so there's no raw edges and then you can just pull closed and there we are cute huh um yeah as i said i made these really nice and small i would suggest slightly larger um depending on the size of treats that you want to put in also to make it easy to sew uh, and depending on how many you're doing as well this took up um half a fat quarter in size just to make this so i would suggest uh, so no it took up quarter of a fat quarter i beg your pardon so i would suggest that out of a um uh, half meter square you could actually get a couple of bags quite easily um that are double-sided so and these will be things that you can kind of keep and and use year after year which will be like great fun okay i hope you've enjoyed seeing today's tutorial if you've got any questions please do make sure that you leave them in the comments section below i will leave links for the or details of the paints that i've used and all the other bits and pieces um, if you've enjoyed seeing it please remember to give me a thumbs up give a like to the video and uh of course if you are new to my channel which a number of you have been and thank you to everybody who subscribed recently please do make sure you click the subscribe button below and then you'll be sure to see any of my upcoming tutorials and flip throughs and other videos that's it for now folks take care